Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to Lesson 13 from the series on Genesis. It's titled Israel in Egypt, ready for teaching on June 25, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 18. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have now come to the last lesson in this series of Sabbath School Lesson Studies about the book of Genesis. This amazing book that tells us about your hand from creation right through to Israel being in Egypt. They were looking for the promised land and they get that in the next book. But today we pray for your blessing on each of us who are studying your word this week. And as we listen to the lesson pamphlet being read, as we listen to your word being read as well, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. And in our personal lives, in our health lives, in the community in which we live, we pray that your Spirit will work through each of us to help those around us. And today I'd particularly like to pray for those in the northern American area, those in Canada, those in the USA, including Hawaii and Alaska and Mexico and Guatemala and Honduras and Nicaragua and Panama and my friends in San Antonio, Texas, and in San Francisco in California. Lord, as we open your word this week, we pray that we will see Jesus. It's an interesting story, but there is Jesus for us to find. We pray that your spirit will guide us, each one, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 47 and verse 27. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Let's read that again, Genesis 47, 27. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Genesis covers the last years of Jacob and Joseph together. We see Jacob, that's Israel, leave Canaan in Genesis chapter 46 in order to settle in Egypt in chapter 47, and there he will die, we read about in Genesis 49 and 50. And yet, even in this Egyptian setting, the prospect of the promised land still looms large in the background. And we read about that in Genesis 50, verses 22 to 26. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. As soon as Jacob arrives in Egypt, Jacob blesses Pharaoh in chapter 47, thus fulfilling partially, of course, the Abrahamic promise to be a blessing to the nations, as we read in Genesis 12 verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Later, about to die, Jacob blesses Joseph's sons in chapter 48. Jacob also blesses his own sons in chapter 49 and makes impressive predictions concerning each of them in the context of the future twelve tribes of Israel. The fact, however, that Israel dwells in exile in Egypt as strangers is in tension with the hope of the promised land. And though the book of Genesis itself ends with the children of Israel in Egypt, some of the last words of Joseph point to another place, as we read in Genesis 50, verse 24. I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob.
Sunday, June 19. Jacob goes to Joseph. Read Genesis chapter 46. What is the significance of Jacob's departure from Canaan? Genesis 46, beginning at verse 1. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. Then... Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones and their wives, in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him. His sons and his sons' sons, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all their descendants he brought with him to Egypt." Now these were the names of the children of Israel, Jacob and his sons who went to Egypt. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben were Hanok, Palu, Hezron and Carmi. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamid, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar and Shaul, the sons of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamel. The sons of Issachar were Tola, Puva, Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulon were Sered, Elon, and Jaliel. These were the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Paddan Aram, with his daughter Dinah. All the persons, his sons and his daughters, were thirty-three. The sons of Gad were Zephion, Haggai, Shunai, Esbon, Eri, Aradai, and Aralai. The sons of Asher were Jimna, Ishua, Isui, Beriah, and Serah, their sister. And the sons of Beriah were Heba and Malkiel. These were the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bore to Jacob, sixteen persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, were Joseph and Benjamin, and to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin were Bela, Becca, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Muppim, Hopim, and Ard. These were the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, fourteen persons in all. The son of Dan was Hushim. The sons of Naphtali were Jasiel, Gunai, Jeza, and Shilim. These were the sons of Bilhar, whom Laban gave to Rachel his daughter, and she bore these to Jacob seven persons in all. All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body beside Jacob's sons' wives, were sixty-six persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob, who went to Egypt, were seventy. Then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen, and they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel, and he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, because you are still alive." Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, My brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me, and the men are shepherds, for their occupation has been to feed livestock, and they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? That you shall say, Your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers. 
that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. When Jacob leaves his place in Canaan, he is full of hope. The assurance that he will no longer be hungry and the good news that Joseph is alive must have given him the momentum that he needed to leave the promised land. Jacob's departure echoes the experience of Abraham, though in Abraham's case he was heading to the promised land. Jacob hears the same promise Abraham heard from God, namely that he will make him a great nation. We read that in uh, verse 3 of chapter 46. But let's compare that with Genesis 12 too. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. God's call here also is reminiscent of God's covenant with Abraham. In both occasions, God uses the same reassuring words. Do not fear, as he did in verse 3 in chapter 46. And we'll compare that with Genesis 15 verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward which carry the promise of a glorious future. The comprehensive listing of the names of the children of Israel who went to Egypt, including their daughters, in verse 47, his sons and his sons' sons, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all their descendants he brought with him to Egypt, recalls God's promise of fruitfulness to Abraham, even when he was still childless. The number 70, including Jacob, Joseph and his two sons, expresses the idea of totality. It is all Israel that goes to Egypt. It also is significant that the number 70 corresponds to the number of nations in Genesis chapter 10. And we read that earlier in this series of lessons suggesting that the destiny of all the nations also is at stake in Jacob's journey. The truth will become more evident only many years later, after the cross and the fuller revelation of the plan of salvation, which, of course, was for all humanity everywhere and not just for the children of Abraham. In other words, however interesting the stories are regarding this family, the seed of Abraham, and whatever spiritual lessons we can take from them, these accounts are in the Word of God because they are part of salvation history. They are part of God's plan to bring redemption to as many as possible on this fallen planet. And so to finish today, Romans 10 verses 12 and 13 reads, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does Paul say here that shows the universality of the gospel? More important, what do these words say to us regarding what we as a church should be doing to help spread the gospel? Monday, June 20. Jacob settles in Egypt. It's very interesting how, despite all that Jacob has been told about Joseph's being alive in Egypt, the Lord still gave him visions in the night, as we read in verse 2 of chapter 46 yesterday, and in them commanded him to leave. Jacob leaves the land of promise for, of all places, Egypt, which later becomes associated with the one place that God's people do not want to go, as we read in Deuteronomy 17.16. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again." Read Genesis chapter 47, what spiritual truths and principles can we find in this account? Genesis 47, beginning at verse 1, Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all that they possess, have come from the land of Canaan, and indeed they are in the land of Goshen. 
And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And they said to Pharaoh, We have come to dwell in the land, because your servants have no pasture for their flocks. For the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. When Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are one hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and he went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers, and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with bread, according to the number of their families. Now, there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So when the money failed... In the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence, for the money has failed? Then Joseph said, Give your livestock, and I will give you bread for your livestock, if the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when the year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds and livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed, that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Then Joseph brought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sold his field, because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's, and, as for the people, he moved them into the cities, from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. Also the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh, and they ate their rations which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their lands. Then Joseph said to the people, Indeed I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh. Four-fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field and for your food, for those of your households, and as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favour in the sight of the Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day, that Pharaoh should have one-fifth, except for the land of the priests only, which did not become Pharaoh's. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years. So the length of Jacob's life was one hundred and forty-seven years. 
When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now, if I have found favour in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. Then he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. Joseph took five of his brothers to present to Pharaoh and receive from him the grant of land for their future home. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 233. Gratitude to his Prime Minister would have led the monarch to honour them with appointments to officers of state. But Joseph, true to the worship of Jehovah, sought to save his brothers from the temptations to which they would be exposed at the heathen court. Therefore, he counselled them, when questioned by the king, to tell him frankly their occupation. The sons of Jacob followed his counsel, being careful also to state that they had come to sojourn in the land, not to become permanent dwellers there, thus reserving the right to depart if they chose. The king assigned them a home as offered in the best of the land, the country of Goshen, end of quote. Wisely, too, Pharaoh does not encourage these sojourners to become beggars, living off the largesse of their host. He inquires about their occupation in verse 3 of uh, chapter 47. And that reads, Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers, in order that they may adjust better to their new environment. He also is eager to use their expertise and even suggests in verse 6 that they serve him as chief herdsman over his livestock. Then, although Jacob the foreigner is the inferior, the stranger, he stands before the leader of the land, and as the text says, Jacob blessed Pharaoh in verse 7. He, the lowly stranger, is the one who blesses Pharaoh, the ruler of mighty Egypt. Why should that be? The verb Ahmed Lifni, A-M-A-D, L-I-F-N-E-Y, or set before, in Genesis 47.4, is normally used in priestly contexts. As we read in Leviticus chapter 14 and verse 11, Then the priest who makes him clean shall present the man who is to be made clean, and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Considering that in ancient Egypt the pharaoh had the status of the highest priest, this means that, in a spiritual sense, Jacob stands higher than the highest priest of Egypt, higher even than Pharaoh himself. And so to finish today, whatever our station in life, what should it mean to us in how we treat others that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, as it says in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. What obligations does our faith put on us? Tuesday, June 21, Jacob blesses Joseph's sons. As Jacob approaches death, he remembers his earlier return to Bethel. As we read in Genesis 35, 1 to 15, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go to Bethel. 
and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is, Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there, and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Bakoth. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob, your name shall not be called Jacob any more, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke to him Bethel. That's when he received from God the renewed promise of the everlasting possession that we'll read about in today's chapter, chapter 48 verse 4, that was given to Abraham. And we have a note about that in Genesis 17 verse 8. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. The hope of the promised land is therefore a comforting thought that nurtures his hope as he feels death coming. Jacob turns then to Joseph's two sons who were born in Egypt and blesses them, but does so in the context of the future promise regarding his seed. Read Genesis chapter 48, why did Jacob bless Joseph's two sons here and not his grandsons? Genesis chapter 48, beginning at verse 1. Now it came to pass after those things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and set up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring, whom you begat after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was but a little distance to go, to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I have not thought to see your face, but in fact God has also shown me your offspring. So brought them from beside his knees and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. 
Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, and the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the hand of Ephraim, it displeased him, so he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, are the only grandsons that Jacob blessed. They are thus elevated from the status of grandsons to the status of sons, as you read in verse 5. Although Jacob's blessing implies a preeminence of the second, Ephraim, over the first, Manasseh, Jacob's blessing essentially concerns Joseph, as we read in verse 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long, to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. What we see here is a personal testimony about God's faithfulness to them in the past and his promise for them in the future. Jacob refers to the God of Abraham and Isaac in verse 15, who had provided food and protection for them. He is the same God who redeemed me from evil, from all evil in verse 16. Jacob also has in mind the God of Bethel. Genesis 31, 13, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family, with whom he wrestled in verse 29 of chapter 32, and who changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Let's read that in Genesis 32, 26 to 29. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. By referring to all these experiences where God turns the evil into good, Jacob expresses his hope that not only will God take care of the present lives of his grandsons, just as he cared for his own life and Joseph's, but Jacob also thinks of the future, where his descendants will return to Canaan. This hope is clear from his reference to Shechem in chapter 48 and verse 22, which not only is a piece of land that he had acquired, we read about that in Genesis 33:19, but also is a place where Joseph's bones will be buried, as we read in Joshua 24 and verse 32. The bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for one hundred pieces of silver, and which had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. And when the land will be distributed to the tribes of Israel, we read in Joshua 24 verse 1, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves 
before God. Even amid all that has happened, Jacob keeps in mind the promises of God, who said that through this family, all the families of the earth shall be blessed in Genesis 12, verse 3. And so to finish the day, read Acts chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. According to Peter, how was this promise of Genesis 12, 3 being fulfilled? How have we ourselves received this blessing? Acts 3, 25. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless us in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Wednesday, June 22. Jacob blesses his sons. Read Genesis chapter 49, verses 1 to 28. What is the spiritual significance of Jacob's blessing on his sons? Genesis 49, beginning at verse 1. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. Reuben, You are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honour be united to their assembly, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, and scatter them in Israel. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall arouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea, he shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey, lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good, and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden, and became a band of slaves. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him, but his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will bless you, and by the Almighty who will bless you, with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate 
from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them, he blessed each one according to his own blessing. Beyond the prophecies concerning the immediate history of the tribes of Israel, Jacob sees the Messiah and the ultimate hope of salvation. This hope already is indicated in Jacob's opening words that use the expression in the last days in verse 1, a technical expression that refers to the coming of the messianic king. As we read in Isaiah 2 verse 2, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And Daniel 10 verse 14, Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. The text then goes through the future line of each of these men. These are not predestinated fates, as if God willed that each of these would face what they faced. Rather, they are expressions of what their characters and the characters of their children would bring about. God's knowing, for instance, that someone will kill an innocent man is a radically different thing from God's having willed that the killer do it. Read Genesis 49 verses 8 to 12 again. What prophecy is given here and why is it important? Genesis 49 beginning at verse 8. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Over and above human free will, God does know the future, and he had arranged that it would be through Judah that the Messiah would come. Judah? We read about in Genesis 49, 8-12, who was represented by a lion in verse 9, refers to royalty and praise. Judah will not only produce King David, but also the Shiloh, that is, the one who will bring shalom, peace, as we read in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. To him shall be the obedience of the people, we read in verse 10 of chapter 49. The Jews had long seen this as a messianic prophecy, pointing to the coming Messiah. And Christians too have seen this text as pointing to Jesus. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be, it said in verse 10, which is perhaps a precursor of the New Testament promise that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in Philippians 2 verse 10. Let's read that whole verse. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things on earth and those under the earth. As Ellen G. White wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 236, the lion, king of the forest, is a fitting symbol of this tribe, from which came David and the son of David, Shiloh, the true lion of the tribe of Judah, to whom all powers shall finally bow and all nations render homage. End of quote. And so to finish the day, why should we be rendering homage to Jesus now, even before all nations will do it?
Thursday, June 23, The Hope of the Promised Land Read Genesis chapter 49, verse 29, through to chapter 50, verse 21. What great themes of hope are found in the conclusion of the book of Genesis? Genesis 49, beginning at verse 29. Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptian mourned for him seventy days. Now, when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favour in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying, in my grave which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. Only their little ones, their flocks, and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great gathering." Then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. He observed seven days of mourning for his father, and when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor at Atad, they said, This is a deep mourning of the Egyptians. Therefore its name was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. So his sons did for him just as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite as property for a burial place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who went up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went down and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and spoke kindly to them. The conclusion of Genesis is made up of three events that are filled with hope. First, there is the hope that Israel will return to the promised land. Moses, the author of Genesis, describes Jacob's and Joseph's deaths and burials as events pointing to the promised land. 
immediately after his blessing and prophecy on the twelve tribes of Israel, in chapter 49, verse 28, Jacob thinks of his death and charges his sons to bury him in Canaan, at the cave of Machpelah, where Sarah was buried, as we've just read in verses 29 to 31 of chapter 49. The narrative describing the funeral procession toward Canaan becomes a precursor to the exodus from Egypt several centuries later. Second, there is the hope that God will turn evil into good. After Jacob's death and burial, Joseph's brothers are worried about their future. They are afraid that Joseph will now take his revenge. They come to Joseph and prostrate themselves before him, ready to become his servants, as we read in chapter 50, verse 18, a scenario that is reminiscent of Joseph's prophetic dreams. Joseph reassures them and tells them to not be afraid in verse 19, a phrase that refers to the future, as we read in Genesis 15 verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Because what was meant evil against him God meant for good, we read in verse 20 of chapter 50, and turned the course of events towards salvation, as we read in verses 19 to 21. And we'll compare that with Genesis 45, verses 5 and 7 to 11. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life, and verse 7, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. That is, even despite so many human failures, God's providence will overrule. Third, there is the hope that God will save fallen humankind. The story of Joseph's death in this last verse of Genesis is broader than just about his death. Strangely, Joseph does not command to have his bones buried. Instead, he points to the time when, in verse 25, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here which they did many years later, in direct obedience to those words, as we read in Genesis 13:19, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. Ultimately, the hope of the promised land, Canaan, is a symbol, a precursor to the ultimate hope of salvation, of restoration, of a new Jerusalem in a new heaven and a new earth. The ultimate hope for all of us, a hope made certain by the death of Shiloh. And so to finish today, read Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 4. How do these verses represent the grandest hope that we have? Without this promise, what hope do we have other than death alone as the end of all our problems? Revelation 21, beginning at verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away.
Friday, June 24. From the pen of Ellen G. White in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 239 and 240, we read, The life of Joseph illustrates the life of Christ. It was envy that moved the brothers of Joseph to sell him as a slave. They hoped to prevent him from becoming greater than themselves. And when he was carried to Egypt, they flattered themselves that they were to be no more troubled with his dreams, that they had removed all possibility of their fulfilment. But their own course was overruled by God to bring about the very event that they designed to hinder. So the Jewish priests and the elders were jealous of Christ, fearing that he would attract the attention of the people from them. They put him to death to prevent him from becoming king, but they were thus bringing about this very result. Joseph, through his bondage in Egypt, became a saviour to his father's family. Yet this fact did not lessen the guilt of his brothers. So the crucifixion of Christ by his enemies made him the redeemer of mankind, the saviour of the fallen race, and ruler over the whole world. But the crime of his murderers was just as heinous as though God's providential hand had not controlled events for his own glory and the good of man. As Joseph was sold to the heathen by his own brothers, so Christ was sold to his bitterest enemies by one of his disciples. Joseph was falsely accused and thrust into prison because of his virtue. So Christ was despised and rejected because his righteous, self-denying life was a rebuke to sin, and though guilty of no wrong, he was condemned upon the testimony of false witnesses. And Joseph's patience and meekness under injustice and oppression, his ready forgiveness and the noble benevolence toward his unnatural brothers represent the Saviour's uncomplaining endurance of the malice and abuse of wicked men, and his forgiveness not only of his murderers, but of all who have come to him, confessing their sins and seeking his pardon. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Once Jacob died, Joseph's brothers feared that now Joseph would get revenge. What does this teach about the guilt that they still harboured? What does Joseph's reaction teach us about forgiveness for the guilty? 2. What other parallels can you find between the lives of Joseph and Jesus? 3. Dwell on the fact that although God intimately knows the future, we are still free in the choices we make. How do we reconcile these two ideas? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Praying for Ten Years, and it's by Andrew McChesney. Winston Crawford, a U.S. volunteer teaching English in Moscow, invited one of his Russian students to the Seventh day Adventist Church on Sabbath. The student, Sasha, did not seem moved by the worship experience. He had been raised in an atheistic family and he looked downright bored. Winston felt sad. I'm not going to try to invite him back, he told himself. I can see clearly that he didn't enjoy himself. Instead, he started praying. He prayed that the Lord would touch Sasha's heart. As the months rolled by, Winston and Sasha struck up a friendship. During vacation, Sasha invited him to travel to the Karalia region near Finland to meet his parents and younger brother. Winston kept praying. After completing his year of volunteer service, Winston returned to the United States but remained in contact with Sasha. When Sasha visited the United States after several years, the two spent time together in Chicago. Winston kept praying. More than ten years passed. One day, Sasha sent a message via WhatsApp. I want to read the Bible, he wrote. Could you help me to understand it? Winston was delighted. Sure, he texted back. They agreed to meet once a week. 
At their first meeting, Sasha was fascinated as they read Genesis 1. He was particularly impressed that God gave a vegetarian diet in Genesis 1.29, which says, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Sasha was a vegetarian, and he had thought that following a plant-based diet was simply good practice. I had no idea that this is from the Bible, he said. At the end of the meeting, he expressed awe. I have read Pushkin and Dostoevsky, but it seems like something different is happening when I read the Bible, he said. It's like the words are coming up off the page to me. Winston was elated. He felt certain that the Holy Spirit was elevating his word to reach Sasha's heart. After three weeks of Bible study, Sasha asked whether they could increase their meetings to twice a week. Winston kept praying, It's inspiring for me that after more than ten years he wants to read the Bible, and not only that, but I get to study the Bible with him. Winston said in an interview, I know this is God. I know it completely is God. And that beautiful smiling photograph is on this page as well. This mission story illustrates spiritual growth objective number five of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to disciple individuals and families into spirit-filled lives. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.